Okay, well, we're going to promptly get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, to all of you that are joining us on this Zoom. Uh, the reason why you have stayed mute is so that this is being recorded. I and my gracious co-facilitator, Dr. Alicia Tatum, Program Director of Congregational uh, Leadership over at Islamic Christian and Jewish Studies. And so I'm so grateful to co-facilitate with you today. Um, we have a simple program, our Baltimore Interfaith Coalition. And if you're joining us for the first time, our mission statement is absolutely clear. It's about developing authentic, accountable relationships across religion, race, and class in order to continue the work of dismantling racism personally, communally, and institutionally. And we'll share that in the chat box for you to always to um, reflect on and to look back on as well. And so thank you all. And also thank you for sending us your questions beforehand. We greatly appreciate that in a gracious way. Uh, we're gonna ask one of our planning uh, team members um, who is Dr. Matthew Taylor to start us off with prayer before we begin. Dr. Taylor, would you please unmute yourself? Yeah, let's pray. God of justice, we come today from different traditions, but with a common concern for seeing racism dismantled in our city, in our institutions, and in our relationships. God who created us all, grant that as we gather, we may have ears to hear each other's voices, eyes to see the injustice in our community, and courage to join you in your work of justice. God of wisdom, by your words, all things have come into being. Let your words be our words today. Let your wisdom guide us in finding common cause. Let your view of humanity that privileges no one but mercifully embraces all become our own vision. Amen. Oh, I have myself mute there. I apologize. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for that gracious prayer. Um, the reason why we are here today um, is to discuss uh, the current responses of COVID-19. And I and my co-facilitator, uh, Dr. Alicia Tatum, who's program director that also involves a congregational leadership at Islamic Christian Jewish Studies. I and myself, Dr. Taylor, will co-facilitate this discussion that we'll have with Dr. Jeff Freeman who is our gracious speaker for today. And we will talk more about what he does in quite a, in, in quite a second. Uh, but before we begin, I typically kind of give the question as to why we're here today and why this particular thing is important. Well, obviously COVID-19 is no secret to any of us throughout the entire year that we have been dealing with this entire situation, this extremely unfortunate pandemic. What this pandemic has shown is the disparities, specific disparities among ethnic groups and how it has uh, unfortunately unveiled areas of racism uh, between the cases as well as the positivity rates. If you look even in Maryland alone, that they are still treading one of the number or the second highest among people of color getting COVID-19. And so now we're at a point where we have vaccines and we're very excited and grateful for that. But if the truth be told, many of our community are still asking uh, those questions and have some concerns, such as what's the validity of vaccines or when will these communities receive them? And so we hope that this will actually be a great use of resource today to really get those uh, questions to be answered. And that's why we're recording it. So please share it with your community members um, in any way that you can, because this is gonna be extremely, extremely important. But we would like to uh, introduce Dr. Jeff Freeman by our gracious friend, Dr. Uh, Hathaway, who is the pastor of Union Baptist Church in West Baltimore. And I'd like to have you to introduce our speaker for today before I and Dr. Tatum co-facilitate. Uh, Dr. Hathaway, would you please? Uh, thank you, it's my, it's my pleasure. Uh, Dr. Jeff Freeman not only has the kind of learning, a PhD, uh, master's, uh, he has all of that, but why I am particularly uh, uh, proud of him is that he's one of my sons. Uh, he has uh, a unique marriage of spirituality with scientific inquiry. 
And you're going to see in him, I think, one of the stellar scientists of our day that is well versed in social gospel and the, in the, in the language of, uh, of humanity, but also well versed in scientific uh, understanding. And so uh, I'm happy to present him. Uh, I did want to let him know that as scripture will record, uh, he is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Thank you, Dr. Hathaway. All right. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Alicia Tatum as we begin to co-facilitate co this session. Thank you, Dr. Tatum. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for this important conversation. And I just wanted to begin by asking Dr. Freeman, what brought you to this work? I love how Dr. Hathaway describes how you're able to marry spirituality and the science. And so just share with us what your role is on the COVID task force, and if there's a moral or ethical framework that really grounds your commitment to this work, please also share that with us. Sure, absolutely. So first of all, I just wanna um, you know, say how happy I am to be able to, to speak with you all today and, uh, and how fortunate I, I feel um, that you all invited me, um, uh, particularly to this kind of uh, setting and, and, and given the, the purpose of this group. Um, I also just have to say, uh, starting out, um, these are my opinions and not necessarily the opinions of the federal government um, or of the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab or of the Hopkins Institution uh, at large. Um, so having said that, uh, yeah, I can tell you a little bit about my, uh, my role. I also want to say if I, if I don't give you know, very clear detail on some of these answers. Some of that is because I, I, I am not allowed to. I, uh, I am actively uh, supporting um, uh, the federal government. And uh, like most of us involved in the response, we are under non-disclosure agreements for certain aspects. And some of this stuff, justifiably so, um, you know, we're talking about personal health information uh, um, and, and things that, that ought not be shared publicly. So, so I just want to be clear, I will, will be as forthright as uh, I am able. Um, so yeah, so as far as my role, so I, uh, I, I am with the Johns Hopkins Enterprise, but I am in uh, what's called the Applied Physics Lab. For anybody not aware of that, uh, we are what's uh, called a university affiliated research center. So it's actually a little bit different than the, than the, the more traditional Hopkins that most folks know. Um, university affiliated research centers were stood up during uh, the Second World War to provide, uh, you know, quote unquote, critical contributions to critical challenges. So um, basically, whatever the, the big audacious um, challenge was facing the nation at that time, uh, it was the purpose of a university affiliated research center to go in and, and solve that riddle. Um, there are lots of things that, 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 that we have done over the years, some of which you may be aware of, like our, our space work, the, the Parker Solar Probe that's currently orbiting the sun, or the New Horizons mission to Pluto. Those are things that we designed, built, and managed mission control from our campus in Laurel. But there are other things that you're probably not aware that, that we were involved in, uh, like uh, GPS was actually an invention uh, of the Applied Physics Lab. Um, as I mentioned, we're actually located in Laurel, Maryland. Um, we are a collection of about 7,500 scientists working on a 500-acre campus. Primarily, some of us are, of course, deployed. I'm about to deploy, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you view it. <laughs> um, uh, but, but yeah, we, we work on whatever the, the critical challenges are across government. That might be Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, or in my case, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. So in my day job, I am uh, uh, essentially I direct what's called our Prevention, Preparedness, and Response Program, uh, which is the program that handles any work that we do on behalf of the United States Centers for Disease Control, um, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. That's the, the U.S. agency that leads uh, pandemic response, um, and then BARDA, which is the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. Um, I say that's my day job because right now uh, my job looks quite different. So in, in late March uh, of this past year, um, some of our, our colleagues in the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response uh, reached out and asked if we could mobilize a team to support uh, the White House uh, Coronavirus Task Force. Uh, we initially supported under the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Department of Homeland Security, and then later under the, and as we are now and will be doing so for at least another year, 
under the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, in that role, and this is public, you know, we, we do operations analysis and, and modeling, COVID-19 forecasting and, and prediction, uh, and then just sort of on-call uh, sort of a request for information and other kinds of, of planning types of things. Um, some of our work also includes, you know, out, out in the field and, and, and looking at interventions. So, so I can't speak into detail ab uh, about my deployment per se, but part of that is looking at interventions that can help to reduce the overall hospitalization rate and subsequently the death rate associated with this pandemic. We don't have a lot of tools in our box, pharmaceutically speaking, and we need to, to understand those that we do have and make sure that we can scale those up as, up as quickly and appropriately as possible. Um, to the second part of your question around my, my motivations, and, and I apologize uh, uh, to Dr. Hathaway for having to hear this again, because he has had it may, heard it many times over the years as uh, he and his, his biological son, I don't know if, where we rank on his list, um, uh, at, we're, we're, we're quite close in college and, and stood up a humanitarian organization. So, um, but a lot of it comes from, from how I uh, was raised. And, um, you know, my, my mother was notorious for, for putting quotes from different people all over our, our household and above our beds. And so it's first and last thing we saw, but there was uh, one quote in particular um, from Dr. King's that, that really resonated with me. Um, and that was uh, that a person has not yet begun to live until they can rise above the narrow confines of their own individual concerns to the broader concerns of humanity. And, and for my mom, that, that was life. Right. And 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 that for me has guided a, a lot of, of my pursuits. Um, I have have wanted uh, from a young age to figure out how to do that. I, I didn't know how to do it well. And, and, and particularly as a as a young adult, uh, I, you know, I had all of the ambition and, and probably none of the discipline. So it took me a while to figure it out. But, you know, eventually you stay stay at it long enough, and and you start to find a way to to sort of make your mark and 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 in a way that makes the most sense for me. And so, I came to the applied physics lab after having been in the humanitarian sector for a period of time, um, and and I came with the explicit goal of figuring out how to take science and innovation that is 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 far too often just the purview of the defense and the intelligence communities. Um, and figuring out a way to draw a more direct line um, and provide a more direct and, and quick impact uh, on, on communities that, that otherwise would not get that or, or would get it too late. Of course, that involves communities of color. It, it, it involves much more than that, right? Uh, communities that, that are of lower economic status, right? Communities that are not American at all in nature, communities that uh, you know, are in different parts of, of, of the world or have uh, different religious affiliations and, and making sure that those folks have access to and are able to, to understand and utilize the kinds of innovations that can improve it and, and, and ultimately protect their lives. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. That actually leads to my, um, my next question. Um, and my, my, my question is, um, so talk about the impact um, this has had on communities of color, in particular around COVID-19. And what are your concerns with those communities uh, about getting the vaccine? Yeah, I mean, so, so first of all, just the impact of COVID. I mean, and, and this is, 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 you know, I, I, I think it's public knowledge and, and there are a lot of uh, actually publicly available, very high quality um, studies looking at, at the impact on, on communities of color and, and on the black community in particular. Um, and, and what we have seen is that there is a disproportionately negative impact on those communities, right? They have, um, you know, higher infection rates, they have higher death rates, they have more severe illness in all likelihood, and I bet we will see this in the future. Um, we'll probably see more uh, severe and higher rates of longer term disabilities and, and, and impacts uh, within those communities. Um, we could talk for days, weeks, months on all the reasons why. Um, you know, some of those are the obvious things, right? The way in which 
um, uh, communities of, of color in the United States and, the, and as well as the black community um, have been oppressed systematically, right? Um, have uh, what that means in terms of rates of poverty, what that means in terms of access to and utilization of health services, the timing under which people receive that care, um, and really so much more. I mean, if we wanted to, we could break all the way down to genetic and what we call epigenetic levels that actually transfer across generations, right? Um, so impacts that that an individual may grow up in, in an affluent and, and, and privileged life today, and yet still have physiologic impacts from several generations before. Um, I won't get into the science of that on this talk, but, but, but that science is clear. Um, so for all of those reasons, we know that these communities are going to be hit harder, right? So that's, that's one, right? Um, and then two, to get very specific to the question of vaccine, I think it actually also relates to other forms of access and utilization of health services, right? COVID, like cancer, like heart disease, like so many other ailments, um, oftentimes your prognosis, how, you know, how, how successful you will be at recovering from these ailments is, is, is predicated on the timing of your diagnosis um, and the, the quality and the level of treatment that you receive early on. Communities of color are slower to, to recognize those ailments, are slower to receive care, to confirm the need to receive treatment. And also the treatment itself is unfortunately and oftentimes not the same quality, right? That's not always intentional, right? But, but in some cases it is, but in many cases it is not, but it is nonetheless just as impactful, whether intentional or not. And when we think about vaccines in particular, which is just a part of uh, our a health service, right? A part of this bigger picture, I fully expect that communities of color will be slower to adopt vaccination, right? And, and, and we can imagine why, right? Like when, when we look at the history, particularly that this nation has had in terms of, you know, something like very quickly developed and, and distributed medical care or research in particular. Now, I wanna be careful here when I say very quickly as it pertains to this COVID vaccine. This has been done quickly, but it has not cut corners, right? This, this is something that can be trusted, that can be used, that should be used. Um, it's not to say that there are no risks, right? There are risks, there are always risks. But one of the things that is, is often lost um, for folks who are not explicitly in the, the medical community or, or more specifically working on vaccination is that people, it's easy for folks to understand and consider if I go get this vaccine, there is some risk associated with that vaccine, no matter how minor. What they often don't consider is the other part of that decision, which is if I decide not to get that vaccine, what is the risk to me, to my life, to my loved ones? And the, the point, if there's one singular thing I, that, that you all should, should, should do everything in your power to get across to the communities that you support um, is that when you put those risks up against each other, there is no comparison, right? The risk of not getting a vaccine if you have it available to you is exponentially higher than any risk of getting that vaccine. And that's a decision in every instance should be an emphatic yes. I am literally going to hang up off of this Zoom today and drive to a health department to receive my vaccination before I am deployed to the field. And we appreciate you highlighting that. Thank you, Dr. Tatum. Yeah, just a follow-up question. You talked about you know vaccines being a part of a bigger picture, a bigger approach that we need to take. So I, I was just curious just to hear um, maybe some other things that we need to be aware of when we're talking to our communities, not just about vaccination, but maybe some other um, methods and practices we also need to implement. Yeah, I mean, I think some of this is the stuff that you hear, you know, on the news fairly, fairly often, right? People try to drive this stuff home, things like socially distancing, right? Things like, like wearing a mask, 
Um, I think a really important thing to know about both of those measures, one, they're in your own control, you can do them now. Um, they're not predicated on a distribution uh, of, of a vaccine or what class of, of you fall in, in terms of like at what, at what timing you're allowed to give the vaccine, right? Of course, they start with clinicians and so forth and so on, and then high risk communities. Um, but those are in your, your power, of course, to actually to, to do. But the other thing to understand is that one of the things driving this particular pandemic are what we call asymptomatic infections. These are people who are carrying the agent but have no symptoms whatsoever. They don't know, right? Which means you can feel great and walk right into your grandmother's or mother's or father's house, infect them, and eventually, and I say this aggressively, purposefully, kill them, right? Like that is that, and I say it in that way because I think we are so far along in this now that people are fatigued, people are tired, people are exhausted. The idea of not seeing our family any longer or not being able to hug or kiss them um, because they happen to be of a high risk group is hard to accept, right? And so, but I wanna make sure that people understand just how absolutely serious this is because we have to protect those people. In addition to that, and this is the other thing that I think sometimes is lost, even if you're an individual who doesn't come into contact with what we would call a high risk group, somebody with certain comorbidities, somebody uh, who is over the age of 65 and, and, and might have COPD or something like that. Even if you have no context like that, if you are not wearing a mask, if you are not social distancing, if you're not doing the basic things to protect yourself, what you're going to do in all likelihood is come into contact with that agent because it is that infectious and you're probably gonna spread it around unintentionally. Now you won't spread it around to your immediate people who are high risk, but you'll spread it to somebody else who is in a group that does make contact with somebody high risk. And that gets around, right? And that is, is, is just a really important um, thing to, con to, to consider in the way in which we, we, uh, we manage our, ourselves. And, you know, I mean, it's that whole point of, you know, loving thy neighbor, right? Like how we, it, you know, it, actually, this is, is one additional point that I think is really key, is that vaccinations are useful. Um, uh, pharmaceutical interventions, drugs, monoclonal antibodies, antivirals, those are also helpful, but none of those are nearly as impactful as human behavior. We see this in, we saw it in, in uh, I, the best comparison I can give you is when the Ebola outbreak hit West Africa, um, we had no vaccine. When the Ebola outbreak hit the DR Congo, we had a vaccine, but the DR Congo outbreak lasted almost twice as long as the West Africa outbreak because it is entirely predicated on human behavior. And that's important because what it means then is the single most powerful um, tools for reducing the spread and containing this outbreak and eventually halting it are actually in our own hands based on our own human behavior. And that is something that is, is I think, empowering, but also critical. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. Um, I love how you're really honing in on this, this both and approach. It's not either or. Like there's things that we can do in our own control, but then also looking at you know, the vaccinations. And so I, I appreciate you holding both of those up. And so as you look to the future and the work that you're doing, what would you say the impact of your work will be not only on um, a local level here in the Maryland area, but as we think about this nationally and even globally, what would you say the impact of your work will be? Well, I don't know what it will be. I'll say what I hope it is. Um, you know, there, there's, you know, it's challenging. I, 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 so, so actually, um, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before, yesterday was Monday, right? It's, I feel like it's all molding together. Um, but yeah, so, so yesterday, uh, you know, we had a, uh, an internal sort of pr uh, presentation with all of the people that work on projects in my program. Um, and, and what I was trying to do was establish our culture and expectations and facilitate what I hope will be a productive um, and, and, and innovative uh, uh, program. Um, and in doing that, I talked about sort of our core principles. 
And one of those was this, this, this principle of keeping at it, but, but, but more specifically of fostering creative tension. And in that talk, I actually drew a parallel um, to the civil rights movement. Now, now I bring this up because this is really important in terms of like the lack of sensitivity coming from, from folks who are not representing a community of color, right? Um, I had an image actually on that slide where I was talking about the creative tension necessary to combat the status quo in our health and medical systems to innovate, to improve, to, to, to fundamentally change the way in which we are, are treating people and populations. But I had an image of Dr. King, the, that famous picture of him actually being uh, 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 arrested. where He's got like one arm behind his back and he's at the, I, th I think it was a diner maybe. Um, and that, that triggered something in, in one of our staff members, right? That was uncomfortable for them. And, and they, obviously those, those folks do not know me. They do not know my background or my work, but, but what was important, and I think the lesson that I took from that, because they, they had mentioned it um, uh, to some folks uh, in their own group who were kind enough to bring that to me, is that it was not apparent to them why that connection was critical, right? And, and what the, the point that I didn't get over, and this is actually, we'll circle back around specifically to your question, is that the same forces, the same status quo within our health and medical systems that has limited our ability to effectively contain and respond to this outbreak are the same forces that have maintained a health system that disproportionately impacts in a negative way communities of color. And so we are not just fighting against innovation or research and development, we are fighting against much bigger forces than that, right? To change the status quo in, in our field to make a meaningful impact in health and medicine, not only must fight against those same forces, but must be mindful of those same forces because only then can we actually have the kind of impact that improves not just the population level um, indicators and, and, and outcomes, but, but improves the, the, the outcomes for those who have traditionally been left behind by those changes. Um, and so that was really instructive for me, but, but that speaks to what I want this to do. I didn't come to APL to help people who are walking into Brigham and Women, Women's Hospital or Johns Hopkins Hospital you know, in, in Baltimore. It's to help people who traditionally don't have that kind of access and do not have that kind of care. Doctor, thank you. This is uh, so, so grateful for this. Um, many of us was able to submit a few questions and we're going to try to get to a couple of them. Um, and so we've got a lot of folks who, you know, your, your pastor, your community leader, they, they kind of look at us to, you know, all of a sudden just have an answer out of nowhere, you know, and I think it's, it's clear that many of us will be carrying some weight on, on, on building towards the, the, uh, affirmation on getting vaccines out, even in our particular communities. But many folks um, who will ask uh, from our communities is this one question, will the vaccine stop you from COVID, getting COVID? Is it a flu? Is it, is it like the flu shot? Can you still get it, but less threatening? Um, can you answer that in any way you can? Yeah, I mean, I would say that the, the, the vaccine will, will ultimately protect you much more so than now. So I, I think they said the efficacy rate, so that's just, you know, if you're an individual and you are vaccinated, what percentage of those folks don't get COVID over some period of time? And they were seeing somewhere between 90 and 95% of people that got the vaccine in comparison to say a, a control group, a group not vaccinated, um, were protected. Um, it is by no stretch of the imagination foolproof. And like the flu vaccine, the effectiveness of the COVID vaccine will be predicated on the percentage of population that have it. Because what ultimately happens, um, and actually this will allow me to make a, a, a point about the flu vaccine, um, is the, the, the more folks that have it, the less of that infectious agent that are circulating in the population, which lowers the probability that you will come into contact with it and lowers the likelihood you will become infected 
become ill, potentially die, right? So it, it is to say that getting it makes you safer for sure, but more people getting it, the love thy neighbor thing, right? Like the more protected you are, the more effective it is. This is also absolutely fundamentally true about the flu vaccine and go please get the flu vaccine because these are absolutely related. The biggest concern we have about COVID is, and this will sound a little callous, but it's not that X number of people are dying from COVID. It's that if you let it spread, if you let it run rampant, it will eventually create such a strain on our health system that there will be no ICU or ED beds available for folks to walk into. And if you don't have those, not only are people gonna die of COVID, they're gonna die of the flu, they're gonna die of car accidents, they're gonna die of any number of things because we're gonna start doing like they're doing out in California where it's like wartime triage, right? Don't bring them to the hospital unless th there's a reason we can help them survive, right? So, so that is super important. But the other thing are, are sort of the downstream effects, right? When you look at the flu, the flu traditionally kills the, the elderly, the very young, and those who are immunocompromised. Now, thankfully, COVID doesn't appear to be impacting the very young in the same way that the flu does, but it is, but it is exactly impacting the very old um, and those immunocompromised as the flu is, right? And so one of the reasons why you get a flu vaccine, even if you are healthy, is that by getting that vaccine, as I said, if there are more people that get it, there's less of that agent circulating in the population. And then there's a lower probability that that agent is going to reach an elderly person, or in the case of the flu, an infant, right? And if, if you just increased by, you know, X, you know, X number of percentage, you know, the amount of population that get the flu shot, you would have a very real and measurable, quantifiable number of potentially thousands that do not die. I mean, you know, hundreds of infants, right? Every year die needlessly because not enough people get the flu vaccine. And I think a lot of it is because a lot of folks think, well, I don't personally need it, but it is so much bigger than us. And, and the same is, is true for the COVID vaccine, you know, with the one difference being the impact on the very young. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so my question, and I think we have time too, if Dr. Tate, you have another question as well. Uh, what role can we, because many of us are religious and non-religious groups or community groups, what can this coalition and others on this Zoom can do to promote and help with the vaccine? What can we do to, to assist in the gracious work that you and others are doing to get that out there so we can uh, get this whole pandemic under control? I mean, I think first and foremost, just, you know, in encouraging people, um, well, one, letting them know there's some light at the end of the tunnel, right? I mean, for as severe as this is right now, um, we did see a seasonal impact on COVID last year, right? As people were able to get outdoors as opposed to indoors, um, uh, you know, and as certain lockdowns, right, as people started to become, it was more common to wear masks, fewer people sitting in small buildings under a single HVAC system where the agent is able to infect more people. So say a restaurant, right? Um, but, but, you know, so, so we have, winter will come to an end, right? Vaccine distribution for as challenged as it has been will improve, it will scale eventually. There are other treatments that the U.S. government is aggressively pursuing um, to make sure that they can scale that up to, to bring down the overall hospitalization rates as well. And as we said, we have a highly vective, uh, effective vaccine. That is super, super important. Um, so we're going to get there. Now, maybe that's not until the end of summer before life truly returns to something resembling normal. Maybe sooner if things are, you know, you know move a little more quickly than they are now. Um, but, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. So just be resilient for a few more months. Be careful for a few more months. Wear your mask, you know, social distance. Avoid small areas where there is a single HVAC system. For, for reason, I mean, we could get into the aerosol physics of it, but that will bore you. Needless to say, if you're in a small area, you're under a common HVAC system, that's going to circulate and you're gonna be in, that's, if you're in a restaurant, what it means is you're coming into contact with that at a higher concentration over an extended period of time. That's why there's so many people that get infected by it. 
Um, so avoid those spots, right? Still support your local restaurants, just do takeout, right? You know, that, 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 that would be helpful. Um, if you're going, you, you know, people have got a grocery shop. If you can't do it online and have it delivered to your house, then make sure you get in and you get out quickly. Don't linger in a rest or, or in, in a grocery store. It's a bigger area, right? Less risk than a restaurant, but we have seen cases being driven from, from, from grocery stores as well. Um, so do those things. In the case of the vaccine, let people understand that it, like, it is so hard to get a vaccine approved. Like I, I cannot begin to tell you any, any suspicion that, that it's somehow like a pharmaceutical company that like leaned on somebody and approved it, just not true. There are way too many processes in place to get something through, right? Like it is so hard and vaccine science is well established, you know? And we've seen nothing, nothing to suggest that receiving this vaccine poses a real threat. To, to people, right? Maybe you'll have an allergic reaction. Maybe you'll feel bad for a couple of days, which is common by the way. Every time I get a vaccine, I feel sick for like two, three days. And that is, you know, my wife doesn't have that problem, but all it is is it's your body responding. Your body's building up the immunity. In fact, whenever you feel sick, it's not the infectious agent that make, that's making you feel sick. You don't have a fever because of the agent. You have a fever because of your body's response to the agent. Right. So when you feel sick after a vaccination, that's normal. Right. So, and then those are really the main risks that we're concerned about. Under very, very rare circumstances, something more severe could occur. But trust me when I say the risk of that ain't anywhere close to the risk of you falling ill, going about your normal routine life, um, going grocery shopping, going you know, out in public and, and, and seeing your friends and family. So just encourage those things, you know, to the extent that you can model those behaviors, all the better, right? Don't be like any of the, the, the public officials who've been nailed on TMZ for, uh, you know, do, do, do as I say, not as I do. Um, I, I know there've been a few that have gotten hit recently. Uh, model the behavior that you want your communities to, uh, uh, to, 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 to carry out. Dr. Tatum, was there anything else that you wanted to say for the good of the order? I just wanted to say thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. Um, you've just um, given us a lot of information for us to reflect on and even take back to our community. So we just thank you for your time and just your candor in this moment. So just thank you for the work you've been doing. No, thank you guys for having me. I, I like I, um, I mean, first of all, I'll do anything uh, that, uh, that Rev Hathaway asks for sure, because uh, uh, you know he's been uh, an incredible mentor and 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 fathered me in 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 so many ways, um, and also because I'm you know I'm trying to outcompete Alvin, um, who keeps beating me. His kid, he had a kid, took me a little bit longer to have my first kid. Then he has a second kid, <laughs> and now my wife is pregnant with our second kid. So we're chasing him, but we we can't quite catch him. He's a, he's he is you know, quite frankly, an exceptional human being. So, um, but no, I, I, whatever it is I can do, if there, if, if you'd like me to speak to other people, if you just have general questions, if you're concerned about something, if you're seeing on the news, something that, that is alarming to you, um, or, or just have a general question about health, medicine, COVID, vaccination, do not shy away from, you know, shoot me a message, email me, text me, whatever it is, it, you know, my, my friends, my family do it all the time. If I can answer that question, I absolutely will. If I cannot, I'll find someone uh, who can. Well, Dr. Freeman, thank you so much. We greatly appreciate that. And we'll definitely get that out to all participants because I think what's extremely important is that, um, you know, many of us are, are, are pastors and leaders and we typically the biggest thing we do is our gatherings. And so trying to get the data and getting the perspective has been extremely important, particularly for ones who may not have an organization kind of telling them what to do and so forth. Maybe that lonely organization or that lonely uh, particular church that just kind of needs some help or other organizations that they try to be helpful and, and safe in a gracious way. And we thank you for allowing us to share this information for those that aren't here. So that way they could really see 
uh, some truth telling and just how important and serious this pandemic is. And we thank you for giving us that glimmer of hope that shows that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And so we'll be more than happy uh, to share that. And thank you, Dr. Hathaway, for uh, getting this all together. And we thank all of you uh, for taking the time. Um, so um, we'll have that link available. Um, it'll be on, um, we'll, we'll make sure that that'll be shared on the Episcopal Diocese and other areas as well. Uh, we have your emails and information. Uh, so normally uh, we'll, we'll send something out to everybody as soon as we can on that. So we thank you all so much. That way you could share it with your other community members and just really talk about, hey, this is really serious. And this is how we see that light at the end of the tunnel. But it's important that we're all responsible in this as well. And so we thank you. Um, so as I end with a quick uh, moment of prayer, I thank you all in a gracious way for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Freeman. You're always welcome to come back with us again. Let us pray. Gracious Holy One, gracious Spirit, gracious Deity that we all love and look up to. Help us to dismantle racism. Help us to dismantle the things that hold up racism. Help us to be a better human being to one another. Particularly in this pandemic, you have showed us the importance of how we have to be responsible for each other. So help us look out for each other and make sure that we do all we can to protect each other as we see the light at the end of the road. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Take care, you all. We'll see you soon, next month. Thanks, be safe, everyone. Take and care. Thank you, everybody, for joining Bye. us. Bye, all. Thank you.